This week's number, 2,749 pounds. That's how much the winning pumpkin weighed this year at the World Championship Pumpkin Way Off, setting a new world record. My girlfriend said she was coming to our Halloween party dressed as our sex life. She didn't come. Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing Exxon's acquisition of Pioneer, the private credit industry, and Ireland's new sovereign wealth fund. They should be calling it the Tax Avoidance Wealth Fund. Here with the news is Prop G media analyst Ed Elson. Ed, what is going on? Not much, Scott. I'm in London, but I've yet to see you. We should hang out this weekend. Uh, I would, but I don't enjoy your company. Um <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, the good news is uh, I won't be hanging out with you. The bad news is I haven't also I haven't hung out with uh, Caroline and Mia, who are also here doing this like hot girl summer, fifty five and rainy. Welcome to London. Just so you guys know, the sun went behind a cloud yesterday. It'll be out again in May. Um, and uh, but you are you are. I think you guys are going to do really well here. Why, Ed? Why are you here? Do you have family. I was supposed here? to go to a wedding in Lebanon, and this was the easiest way to do it. And then it got canceled because of the war. So it's oh, actually okay. pretty intense. But a wedding in Lebanon. Yeah. Wow, you're so metropolitan. And what are you going to do while right. you're here? Well, I don't know. I, now I've got to make some plans. I'd love to go see a Chelsea game, but I've been stra- scrambling to get tickets. Maybe you can help me out. <laughs> Who are they playing? You should know this. This is Arsenal this weekend. It's Arsenal this weekend? Yes, sir. It's be at huge. Chelsea or at Arsenal? Is it at Chelsea? At Chelsea. Wow, you gotta go. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, we I'm gotta definitely go. going to be there. <laughs> By the way, I was at I was at the game this last weekend. Did you see that Martinelli, 89th minute? Yeah, I saw. Hello, I saw you. Beat Man City. Yeah, impressive. I saw your uh, signature selfie video where you <laughs> you film the whole crowd and then you film yourself right at the end. Yeah, how many times have me. you done that one? Huh? Look at me. Yeah, <laughs> I am. Um, well, that's what they want. They, I remember reading that you get much greater engagement when you have yourself in, and which foots well to my narcissism. Anyways, let's uh, let's get to the headlines, Ed. That's so funny. Is that actually why you did that? <laughs> why I did? The, why I had myself in it? Yeah, was that a calculated engagement? I've done it all the time. They say that just taking mood shots of your environment gets about a third of the engagement. Is when they see that you're there. Wow. Inside yeah. base. Plus, I want, I, <laughs> I want to, um, I have this planned out. So just to do a quick digression, I imagine my death. I envision my death a lot. I know the drugs, the music, the people, the location. I'm planning it out. And uh, one of the things I'm going to do is I want a series of videos playing all the time. So, and I love that Apple thing where they set some cheesy music to, you know, your holiday in Greece or whatever. And somehow they figured out to find all the photos from you in Greece. I think... That's my favorite use of AI. But yeah, I always try and have either me or a little weirded out about putting my kids in that stuff because I wonder if they're going to have facial recognition and then get kidnapped by yeah. somebody at some point. But anyways, fuck this shit. Get on with the headlines, <laughs> Ed. Let's start with our weekly review of Market Vitals. The S&P 500 rose, the dollar was stable, Bitcoin fell, and the yield on 10-year treasuries declined. Shifting to the headlines. <clears throat> The Consumer Price Index showed inflation was stable in September at 3.7% year-over-year, the same as the month before. Utah Utah filed a lawsuit against TikTok, accusing the app of baiting children into addictive and harmful social media habits. Disney is raising prices at its theme parks. Disneyland tickets for popular days are increasing 8%, while five-day passes are increasing nearly 16%. Goldman Sachs is selling GreenSky, the consumer lending firm it acquired just two years ago for $1.7 billion. The sale price was not disclosed, but Goldman will incur an immediate loss from the transaction. And finally, Birkenstock was priced to go public at $46 per share, valuing the company at $8.6 billion. The stock opened, however, at $41 per share and closed its first day of trading down more than 12%. Scott, thoughts on this? There was this interesting data that Mia found that if you look at the delta between the number of people pursuing a job and the number of job openings, when there's a lot more uh, people, job seekers than job openings, inflation is usually very low. And then when there's more 
job openings and job seekers, inflation has been very high. And that delta is is narrowing. And that is there are fewer and fewer. It was about 1.5 job openings for every job seeker over the last uh, six or 12 months. And it's narrowing, which says that inflation should come down. And we've always been very, oh, the term is dovish, hawkish on inflation. I think it's going to continue to come down. I think their target is 2.5%. They're not that far from it at 37 mm-hmm. Uh, Utah filing a lawsuit against TikTok. Something tells me the folks in Beijing are still going to sleep tonight. Um, <laughs> you know, the Mormons versus the Chinese. That's gonna <laughs> that's gonna be an interesting battle. Um, that would make that'd be great in the octagon. Here we have Billy, uh, seven wives, doesn't drink Coca Cola, and over here is a guy that's implanted a neural jack into the to the wet matter of all of your children. We're just gonna let them fight it out. Um, <laughs> That was like so racist and jingoist on so many levels. Okay, uh, look, it, it's mostly symbolic, uh, but the thing that just blew me away was the data you found that TikTok is uh, growing as fast as growing, and that if it maintains this growth rate by next year, it'll be a bigger business than Meta, and within three years, I think it could be a bigger business than Alphabet. And while all of these strikes and all this conversation around media and misinformation, the elephant marching through the camp is TikTok. And that is, it's just, it's just growing. I mean, I'm just blown away. It could be the biggest media company in the world in three to five years. Disney raising prices at its theme parks reinforces the notion that its parks are singular. They have incredible pricing power. I would argue that raising five-day passes by 16% is, would be better called a mental illness tax, that if you make the conscious decision to go to Disney for five consecutive days, or maybe it's five different. Anyways, you're just, you're all fucked up in the head and you should be starched <laughs> from the gene pool. Um, but this, like, I think the parks of the future, I think that's, they've got more pricing power there than any uh, any of their other businesses. And people are spending more money on experiences. I think we also did research that showed something like 10 or 20% of people go to Disney go into debt to go to Disney. It's also pretty interesting that the, actually the cheapest ticket didn't change in price, um, but then the most expensive ticket, probably the one that you get, it's called the Inspire Magic Key Pass. You get access to all the special stuff. That one went up 40%. So it's just a perfect example of the thing that you described before, which is that Disneyland is becoming this strange proxy for wealth inequality in America, uh, where you can ratchet up prices for the top 1%, um, and then the rest of them can't afford it. But it's probably a good... It's a good strategy, right? Because it means that you can keep you're, you're allowing your business to stay to keep up with inflation, um, but at the same time you're extracting value and just targeting inflation to the richest people. So they're doing it right. Yeah, they've and they've done that with these private tours where you pay five or six thousand dollars, no joke, to have six people. I think it's a maximum of six have a private tour guide and a golf cart behind the kind of the bowels of the parks and cut all the lines. Uh, they're absolutely taking advantage of what is, you know, crazy income inequality. And I had a couple of thoughts and I had the same thought both at Universal Hollywood where I took my boys and Disney. And that is they're just not charging enough money. There's too many people here. Mm-hmm. And supposedly the park attendance was way down in Orlando this summer. And I wonder if that's a little bit of a COVID hangover or the spending orgy is coming to an end, or maybe people are going I thought maybe more people are going to Europe because Europe's been closed for the last couple of summers or maybe because Orlando's now like 700 degrees during the summer. But their park attendance was down. But I just remember there's clearly more demand than supply here. Every time I've been, it's just been – it just feels like a fire hazard. There's so many people there. And also that just the rides, the weight on the rides, I found it really depressing that – you know, you're some family from the Midwest, a middle class family, and you save all year to go to Disney and you gotta sit there with a four year old for three hours to get onto the Avatar ride. It just feels just feels wrong. Uh, it just feels anyways, I I found it kind of like sort of jarring. Goldman selling Green Sky, the firm it acquired just two years ago. I you know, like they want out of the business, their adventures in consumer banking are over. Uh, I give David Solomon and the leadership there some credit for trying to innovate. And then the most important thing about innovation that isn't working is you perform infanticide on it and you pull the plug. So, you know, if I were on the board there, I don't think I'd be angry at management here. I think they've got to try stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Birkenstock, this is- Sorry, just just on that that Green Sky point as well. It's interesting that the price wasn't disclosed in, in the announcement because you and I actually discussed this about a month ago 
because there was an article in the in the Financial Times saying that Goldman was in talks to sell it for five hundred million, and it said that you know they were talking to KKR and Sixth Street and this consortium of investors, and now here we are a month later, they have sold it. They sold it to the consortium of KKR and Sixth Street and all the other investors, but now the price is disclosed. So it feels like we can pretty safely assume that this was sold for around half a billion dollars, which is, you know, less than a third of what they paid for it in 2021. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's ugly. They, they'd rather not talk about it openly, although I think it's going to, I think they'll probably have to disclose it at some point. But the big news of the week was Birkenstock. And I knew something was up when my, Guy at Goldman called me and said, I can get you shares in Birkenstock. I'm like, if you're calling me and telling me I can get shares in Birkenstock, that means that that's a really negative forward looking indicator. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, this is an incredible company. It's done really well. It went out uh, at, uh, it opened at 41 bucks a share, despite the fact that it was priced at 46. So it's a broken IPO and it was first day down more than 12%. So this is a busted IPO. And I think there's a larger story here. The IPO market has specifically become the last stop on the pump and dump train. It used to be the place where you'd have to go to maintain growth and get the kind of capital you needed to maintain to become a big company. And two thirds of companies used to be profitable, now it's less than a third. And the company was sort of, had already kind of been through Navy SEAL training and was strong and fit and ready for the big time. And everything has changed. One. Uh, Private companies can find as much capital as they need in the private markets. VC firms did so well through the aughts and the teens that they grew their funds from 300 million to five, seven, and $8 billion. So they have a ton of capital to throw at these companies in the private market. And also Don Valentine, I think was the founding partner of Sequoia Capital. I think he passed away a few years ago, but Sequoia kind of this iconic VC firm. And he said the biggest mistake they made was not holding onto shares for longer. They had backed Cisco, Amazon, um, Yahoo, a bunch of a bunch of the big players, Google, I think. And so what they've done, the VC community has done, is they do hold on to the shares longer. Specifically, as long as the firm continues to grow in value, they're like, why go public? Oh, you want liquidity? Fine, I'll buy some of the founder shares. Oh, you need more capital? No problem. We can put two, three, five hundred million dollars to work. No problem. And so when do they go public? One when they think the jig is up and this thing makes no sense and no one in the private markets wants to continue to fund this bag of shit, specifically WeWork or Blue Apron or Rent the Runway or Allbirds, or uh, we think the value's topped out and we want to perform kind of a head fake and jazz hands and maybe we'll do a, a small round to convince people that, oh yeah, no, it really is worth this much and hope that the greatest fool theory kicks in and retail investors buy this thing. And what do we see? We see IPOs are dramatically underperforming uh, the S&P because they have basically become the wasteland or the septic tank for private market investors that want to, you know, dump the bag or they think that the kind of the game is over and the value creation is over. And the result is that institutions and private capital and very wealthy individuals capture all the upside. And the guy or gal on Main Street no longer gets to buy Amazon or Netflix at the IPO. And the amount of capital these companies are raising is just extraordinary in the private market. SpaceX would have been a great way to uh, acquire wealth or build wealth. But uh, the private market said, no, this company's doing great. We want to we register or capture all the gains ourselves. And they have raised $9.5 billion in the private markets. R Blue Apron, a shitty little company, raised more money in the private market than Netflix or Google combined before they went public. So companies are no longer going public. They wait until there's no more value to be created there, or, or they just want to dump. And the, the result is uh, private. Uh, the private markets have just taken over. And as always, it's the little guy or the little gal that gets hurt here. And Birkenstock, they wanted the private equity firm, bought it $4 billion or 4.2, and they wanted out. And they wanted to they used a series of kind of false signals. They constrict supply to create the illusion of scarcity. Companies used to issue 25% of their shares in an IPO. Now, on average, it's 12% to create this illusion of scarcity. And they usually do stuff to try and signal value. In this case, they said LVMH is committing to buying 300 million in shares. And they've just priced these things really aggressively because the private equity firms want to dump it. And they'll, they're not in it for the long run here. They want out. That's not the business they're in, being in public stocks. But this is a great company. 
it was just overvalued and they have got they got out over the skis you know you could say greedy but people did buy it but the enterprise value to ebitda trailing 12 months for crocs is 7 nike it's 23 on running at 66 and in birkenstock it was 23 uh, the revenue growth uh, was 29% at Birkenstock, 54% at Crocs, 10% at Nike, and 69% at On. I wear Ons because I'm very cool and in the middle of a midlife crisis. And then the operating margins are 24%. I mean, this doesn't look crazy expensive, but the market has decided that um, they're no longer just buying into IPOs because they're IPOs. What are your thoughts here, Ed? Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I think the craziest statistic from the research that we were doing for No Mercy last week was this concept of profitability at the IPO. The, the craziest stat in 1980, eight out of 10 VC backed IPOs were profitable. And then in 2021, the number was one in 10. And then last year, it was literally zero. Not a single VC backed IP, IPO was profitable when it went public. Um, so yeah, I I think I think the trend is dangerous. The thing that's interesting about Birkenstock is that you've had quite a change of tune here on this company. You know, they're growing, they are profitable. It's likely that they just severely overpriced the IPO. You know, they price it around nearly seven times sales. I think the the value the value has slightly come back down to earth. It's now trading at around five times um, 2022 annual sales. So I guess the question that I would pose to you is like, what changed for you? Is it Was it just this sort of structural thing that we've been seeing in the IPO market where you had Arm and Clavio and Instacart underperforming, and then you sort of realize this trend, and then you get that call from your Goldman guy who tells you, hey, do you want in? Or was there something specifically about Birkenstock that got you more, you know, more bearish on this stock? I think it's a great company. It's well managed. I just thought it was overvalued. Um, and the signal I got is when they're calling me and offering me shares. I mean, it's like Woody Allen said he would never want to be a member of a club that would have him as a member. You don't want to invest in IPOs you have access to, at least that your broker's calling you about. Because what that means is, you know, in the oddity IPO is 12 times oversubscribed. And it went from 35 to 55. Now, granted, it's come back down, but people were excited about that. They looked at the valuation and said, AI plus beauty. We can see this company being worth 10 billion and it's worth, you know, it's pricing, I think, one and a half now. And it went to two and a half. Now it's down to 1.3 or 1.4. It's actually recovered a little bit. But I think people looked at Birkenstock and thought, great company, you know, probably worth 8 billion. And they're pricing it at 9.2. And the people who did the math, said, no, we'll pass on this one. And they were right. And when a company closes or opens at 12% below, below where it's priced, that's kind of like a a no-no. But that, I mean, that's not even beginning to talk about the SPAC market where you've had 300 SPACs and 10 of them are trading above their listing price, meaning that if you bought into the SPAC phenomenon, there's a 97% chance you've incurred capital destruction. And then, I mean, the IPO, people don't realize just how shitty the IPO market, I mean, some of these consumer IPO companies, Allbirds, another shoe company, it's off 96% since it's IPO. Well, what about Rent the Runway? That's another cute one, right? Rent a DVF dress, great model, great, interesting. Well, look at the actual numbers here. This business makes no fucking sense. As it scales, it just loses more money. That's a, that's a bankruptcy barreling towards us, unless someone like an Urban Outfitters or a Gap buys it for its customer list. And then Warby Parker, a great company, great brand, great retailer, their IPO is off 75%. So in some, it just feels as if the private markets, private market investors only decide to take a company public when they feel like they're getting an irrational price that is unsustainable or they no one else will fund it in the private markets. No, was, no one was going to fund Rent the Runway in the private markets. So they thought, oh, the markets are hot. It's, we've got a brand. Let's try and get this, this thing public. So it's really it's really interesting. I think you're going to see the is you know are the public markets still viable? Because I can go buy SpaceX, I can buy Ledger, I can buy Epic, I can buy all of these companies in the private market from these secondary exchanges. Now they're much less efficient. It's harder to find blocks. You can't trade it electronically. The commissions are much higher. 
But if you can raise money, buy stocks in the private market, less disclosure costs, less volatility, why go public unless you think, unless you have to? Because, and if you have to, that's a bad sign because there's a lot of private capital out there. Or you think, okay, these guys are fools and they will, they will overvalue this. So the thought in the IPO market has happened. There are some good names getting out there. While their performance has been lackluster, they've raised a lot of capital. The IPO market, I would argue, is back, uh, at least cyclically. But I think you'd have to argue as a mechanism for, for investors to build wealth. No, as always, it's being increasingly captured by a small number of people and institutions. Mm. Well, before we want move on, I just want to shout out the CEO of Birkenstock who went on CNBC on IPO day wearing a shirt with not one, not two, but three buttons unbuttoned. And I believe that makes him the first executive in history to do so. So, uh, you know, didn't help the stock price down 12%, one of the worst performing IPO days ever, or at least certainly the worst in the past two years, but congrats on the CEO for making history there. <laughs> yeah, I heard it. it's it's the worst IPO performance of any company in the last three years of over of where they raised over a billion dollars. Over a billion, I'm pulling, yeah. I'm pulling up. I like it. I think he's just doing a shout out. Oh, look, look what a sexy beast he is with all that <laughs> chest hair. That guy's a Viking. I mean, his attitude is the women aren't allowed to wear sleeves on CNBC. Why should I be able to wear a shirt? <laughs> exactly. Um, I think he's just been. He's probably to, wearing Birkenstocks too. Trying to be. Oh, well, I would imagine we that's should a safe bet. I'm pretty sure he wasn't wearing <laughs> Nikes. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the first story. ExxonMobil has agreed to buy Pioneer Natural Resources, a shale oil producer, for $60 billion. That's its largest acquisition since 1999, when the company was formed through a merger with Exxon and Mobil. With 850,000 acres, Pioneer is the largest oil producer in America's Permian Basin. And that deal will more than double Exxon's footprint and production in the area. Exxon shares dropped 4% on the news, and Pioneer rose 0.6%. So, Scott, this is a pretty big bet on oil. And meanwhile, you have energy companies like BP, which are actually trying to cut down their oil production. So let's just start with this. Is this the right bet? Oh, yeah. Fossil fuels are going to be around for a long time. <laughs> for all the excitement around EVs, I think electric vehicles make up 2% of the automobile market right now. Uh, there's nothing that comes close to the efficiency or the arbitrage of taking fossil fuels and converting them into petroleum or heat or what have you. Um, and all of the all of the jazz hands around a concern for the environment, it's real, but it isn't impacting consumption of oil so far. And uh, Exxon and BP are no longer even pretending. I mean, you don't remember this. You're too young for this, but British Petroleum... Uh, changed their name to BP, and their ad campaign for several years was Beyond Petroleum. And they'd have these commercials showing some almost always ethnically ambiguous scientists in a white coat saying how they were trying to figure out a way to turn algae into sustainable fuels. Like, they were just so concerned about the earth. Meanwhile, I mean, these are the biggest polluters in history. And they could, I mean, if you sort of do as I do, not as I say, it's pretty clear these people don't give a flying fuck about the environment. And they believe that, okay, let's just put out commercials signaling that we care. Uh, but uh, at the same time, and Jason Stavers, our editor-in-chief, said, these are some of the best-run companies in the world. Also, they're incredibly good to their employees. My thesis is the more mendacious and damaging a company is to the world, the better it treats its employees. It's like it's just a really good life on the Death Star. It's, <laughs> you know, the, the food is good. It's got the best gym, you know, it's got the hottest chicks and the hottest dudes at the Death Star bar, you know, everything that it is, these are the best companies that go inside. Whenever I'm in Meta, they're in a great employer. People love mm -hmm. working there and like working there and they have the best coffee and they pay people really well and they invest in their human capital. Uh, you want to talk about a great place to work? Altria, a great place to work. They produce fantastic managers and are you know, tons of great benefits. So, you know, these are these are incredible companies to work for. Anyways, the the bet on U.S. oil production, 
is probably a small is probably a smart bet because it starches out the political instability that these companies have to face. Can you imagine if you have big oil fields in Russia or try to manage what you know oil fields in Africa? I mean, unless you're working with Norway or Scotland, which I think has huge oil reserves. I mean, mm. most of the oil is sitting under the U.S., Russia, the kingdom. And then a bunch of really unstable places outside of Norway, you know, Venezuela. Would you really want to bet a lot of your shareholders' money on a relationship with the Venezuelan government? So it strikes me that they're probably willing to pay a premium to be, and all and like that. I think America, especially the the right, is much more fond of or much more you know amenable to drilling, and people see it as a political statement: drill, baby, drill. That you know, sort of like anti woke and deep in the heart of Texas. So I think it's probably a very good move. And these companies are well run. They're smart. They're actually good companies to own usually. So yeah, yeah. It's strictly distinctive, distinctive the climate change and your grandchildren are uh, likely going to have to migrate uh, to higher ground for whatever reason, or mm -hmm. constantly or constantly be putting on sunblock. Um, <laughs> distinct of that. Yeah, it's a good move. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting when you compare it to the moves of some of these other energy companies. So, you know, we mentioned BP is reducing its oil production by 25% by 2030. It actually, it had originally planned to cut oil production by 40%. But then this year, people started getting more worried about energy, oil prices and fuel prices went up, and it rolled that back and said, no, we're actually going to make it 25%. And then you have Shell, who had a plan to reduce their oil output by one to two percent every year until 2030 and then in march of this year it said oh actually we're going to put that plan on quote review um why do you think these companies are doing that what is what is behind this strange cultural shift at least within the energy companies back into pro oil Energy has been weaponized politically. It seemed like we were gathering a consensus around fossil fuels equals climate change equals forced migration equals an unsustainable future to people on the right are drill baby drill and yeah. see political instability and a defense threat if we're not energy independent. And it's just an amazing business to be able to take this crap out of the ground and then refine it and sell it at 93 bucks a barrel, it's just a great business and demand is going up, it's not going down. So I think they decided, you know, why have they decided to lay off their transition to renewables or clean energy? Because they can. Uh, so they're, uh, yeah, we don't, you know, if you don't, if all of a sudden we said to the automobile companies, you can start or begin again pouring mercury into the rivers, or if we said to food processing plants, you know, you don't need safety concerns and if someone loses a finger, so be it. Um, they would do it, and that's what these companies are doing. the The political pressure, the societal pressure, to a certain extent, is really is decreased. You know, I don't. I think people might yeah. have believed that it wasn't going to increase, but it's actually. I think it's decreased. Would you buy an oil stock? I haven't. Um, is that true? Do I not have a stock? I think I have owned oil stocks in the past. You know, I just. I. It's not. There's enough stocks out there right now for me that I don't need to be in these guys. And I think they're well-run companies. I understand that people buy them. I'm I'm pretty much Darwinian when it comes to the stocks I buy. Uh, I owned Meta for a long time. And then I started, you know, I was complaining about them so much. I thought, well, there's enough big tech that I can probably, I probably don't need to own Meta. Anyways, at the end of the day, I don't own any of the stocks we're talking about. And then just on the deal itself, so they, they bought Pioneer for $253 per share, which is 18% higher than the closing price pre uh, the acquisition announcement. Um, and 18% is actually quite low as far as acquisition premiums go. So in, in 2021, the average premium for public M&A was 37%. Um, and then when you look at the past two decades, the average is similar. It's around 36%. And this is half of that. Do you have any insights on why they paid that amount, but also just more generally, how the terms of these gigantic public M&A transactions are actually determined? Companies aren't sold, they're bought. And that is this, the buyer kind of, to a certain extent, dictates 
the price. And that is at the end of the day, a company's worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So it's benchmarks. See, the, the issue in this industry is I bet there are very tight benchmarks that these companies trade between X and Y multiple. And so, and then they probably said there's synergy here. Every, you'll do better owning Exxon stock. We'll give you a small premium. But there's nothing really strategic here. It's not like they're selling them a technology that they're going to be able to blow out through their distribution channels. It's not, there, this isn't a strategic purchase. This is a, this is a scale purchase. There mm -hmm. isn't a unique technology here. There isn't a unique brand. There's not a lot of IP here. And my guess is firms of this size in this industry trade between a pretty tight multiple. So they weren't going to, they weren't going to pay them a 60% multiple hoping that something about Exxon would magically turn this company into a much more scalable company or a technology that they could that they could scale. So uh, what happens if you're a seller of a company, what I always tell people is you want to wait till you have a credible inbound offer. Well, let mm -hmm. me back up. When to sell a company, and I'll speak as someone who sold small companies and has been on the board of companies when we sell, when they're bigger. Your natural instincts when the company is doing really well is not to sell, is to hold on. And then when things look shitty or tough or really challenging, then your instincts say sell. And what I have experienced is that you want to ignore your emotions and do the opposite. Because buyers and because acquirers are smart. And if your company is really pumping, they'll walk in the door and they'll smell it. And they'll go, wow, this company is doing really well. And you don't need to sell. When you, essentially, you never want to be a forced buyer. So when your company is doing well, you don't need to sell. And then you get an unsolicited inbound offer. That's the time to start a process. And what you do is the following. You hire an investment bank or a good deal attorney. You put out a number of, of you make overtures to a buyer community or a target list of potential acquirers, say half a dozen to a dozen, send them a letter and saying, we have a credible inbound offer. The truth always has a nice ring to it. Uh, we are interested in talking to you. Would you be interested in talking to us? Do you want to speak now or forever hold your peace? And ideally, the key to getting a better price is multiple bidders, full stop. And that's the only way you incrementally get them up to making an irrational offer. And that's what every seller wants, is they want their company to be purchased for an irrational multiple. When I sold my stake in profit in 2002, I think, it was a strategy firm that was doing well, growing well, but it was a services company. We sold, I think, at a valuation of $28 million on $10 million in revenues, $2.8 uh, so that was fine. But market conditions will always trump individual performance. Three years previous to that in 99, I was offered $55 million when the company was doing $5 million in revenue because the market was going crazy. So you want to look at atmospherics. How is the market conditions? Am I doing, is the company doing well? Do we have a credible inbound offer? Could we potentially get multiple bidders in, in the ring? And then when I sold L2, it was doing about $20 million in revenue. We had a credible inbound offer, went out to a variety of bidders, got three letters of intent, got one up to eight times revenues, and then that company bought the number two bidder, and then the third company withdrew. So all of a sudden, I was negotiating unilaterally, which is a place you don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. So I tried to convince myself to be a bit of a sociopath and pretend that I had multiple bidders, and we ended up selling for eight times revenue, which is which is very, very healthy for what is kind of an analytics company at the end of the day. But in some companies are bought, they're not sold. You want multiple bidders, you want a credible inbound opportunity, you want to ignore your instincts. And if you're interested in a liquidity event, sell when the company's doing really well because acquirers will sense that as well. I think the truth always has a nice ring to it. it might be one of my favorite quotes from you. But aside from that, um, antitrust. This is one of oh, the shit, Exxon is one of these companies that, you know. What do you think? I, I, I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea on this either. I mean, Joe Biden well, there said. There we are, adding value to our listeners every day. <laughs> I have less of an idea than you. <laughs> I, it well, seems like there's a well, lot Joe, of people in this business, aren't there? Aren't there? Aren't there quite a few competitors here? I don't know. What percentage? A ton. Of a, a ton. They, but they would, they would basically have double the footprint of the next best shale producer competitor but there are you know there are literally like thousands of of shale producers in america the the context that we should probably just focus on is the fact that biden was 
asking the FTC about a year or two ago to investigate gas prices. Um, you know, people were saying that that the rise in fuel prices was greedflation, not inflation. That is, corporations were just you know rising prices prices because they felt that they could. Um, and he specifically singled out Exxon and Exxon's record profits. He said the company is making more money than God was his quote. Um, what do you that. think? Do, I mean, do you do you have an opinion? Fine, if not. I, no, I remember that. And I, I'm, yeah. I remember saying on Pivot that I thought it was populist bullshit. Yeah. And that is, unless you can prove there's such a concentration of market share, which I don't think there is, that results in their ability to engage in monopoly abuse and, and raise prices um, much faster than inflation. I just didn't see any evidence of that. And oil companies are always big targets. But the whole point of a private enterprise is that you can get to a point of irrational profits or make enormous monster profits. Yep. And if you don't like it, you can go across the street from Exxon to Chevron to Aramco. What, I mean, there's gas stations all over the place with different different badges on them. I don't know about the concentration in the shale market and the impact that has on prices. But I don't think, I haven't heard a lot of antitrust rhetoric around these companies. I just think they're None, easy right? targets. Yeah. I just think they're easy targets for populist rhetoric because the, everyone assumes that the guy running the oil company is Monty Burns lighting his cigars with $100 bills and hiding his radioactive waste somewhere. I mean, it's probably a bit of an apt analogy. But they also went through periods where they lost a shit ton of money. So if you're, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, yeah, fine. If you, what, what the Biden administration or what any administration should do is instead of targeting companies based on populist rhetoric, they should raise tax rates or enforce corporate tax rates such that these companies pay a progressive tax rate, but to single out companies and say they made more money than God, well, that's the point. And I would doubt, you know, Exxon's made a lot of money. A lot of companies are making a lot of companies. So again, I just think that's populist rhetoric. Yeah. Um, we should move on because I thought we were on our second story and we're not right off us. So let's move on to the second story. Private equity giants KKR and Carlyle are launching two new private credit funds that, unlike most private credit funds, will not charge a carry fee. Now, as a reminder, carry is the term for the portion of profits firms take on their investment returns. So in private equity, the standard carry rate is 20%, and in private credit, it's between 10 and 15%. But now KKR and Carlyle are not taking any carry. They will still charge a management fee, though no specific numbers have been disclosed. But this move to eliminate carry is somewhat of a signal that private credit is having to sweeten its terms to win over investors. Uh, so, Scott, what does this move say to you about the now one and a half trillion dollar private credit industry? Well, what you have with alternative investments is that it is a very um, competitive environment. If I were to, when I first moved to New York in 2000, I met a bunch of people in publishing. I met a bunch of people in the hedge fund industry and then a bunch of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. My friends in the publishing industry, hardworking, really smart. Uh, most of them are you know, real estate brokers now or licking their wounds or trying to reinvent themselves or trying to, I mean, they've just got, they've just been kicked in the nuts over and over. My really smart, hardworking friends in alternative investments, many of them through kind of the, kind of call it 2002 to 2016, 17, were no joke making 10 to $20 million a year. I think the period, the 15 year period between 2000 and 2015 will be seen as an absolutely historic period where such a few, where so few people made so much money. Alternative investments was basically, as far as I can tell, a marketing, basically genius marketing. And that was rich people and in institutions like to believe they have access to something special. So we find these incredibly smart people who have special insights, special tools, PhDs, high speed trading systems, and we invest there and a few of them do really well and then they raise a shit ton of capital and usually over time their fees or the returns normalize. But because you're under the impression you're getting something access to something unique or different, you're willing to pay 2% of your investment every year in the form of fees and then give up 20% of the upside. And if you looked at the performance of these things over the last 20 years, they would be best described as bad but expensive. Before costs and fees, active managers on average beat their benchmarks by five basis points. After costs and fees, they underperform the benchmarks. And get this, over a 20-year period, 
95% of large cap actively managed funds have underperformed their benchmark. So if you look at what's happened over the last 20 years, it's been really kind of the land of the giants. I mean, when we talked to Josh, when we talked to Josh Brown, he basically showed that the biggest companies in the biggest decile outperformed everybody else. But no one's going to pay a manager 2 and 20 to buy Apple and NVIDIA. So they're trying to find unique alpha, which underperforms yep. the market, and yet they're charging more. And so people have been withdrawing their money uh, out of these actively managed funds and putting them into low-cost uh, passive funds, specifically like a Vanguard. And effectively here, KKR and Carlisle have said, we want into the Amazon slash Vanguard game. And that is we want massive, we're going to go for the Walmart, Vanguard, Amazon strategy. We're going to create so much AUM that even if we don't take upside, we just charge small fees, there's a really good business here. Yep. And we should be able to aggregate more and more capital because our returns will be higher because we're not taking 20% of the upside. And we'll have companies worth a lot because the consistency of fees, especially if you're growing your AUM regularly, creates a lot of enterprise value. In some, unless you're offering a real specific niche product that I'm doing buyouts yeah. or private middle market credit and biotech in Spain, and I know everything about it, it's going to be very hard to maintain the fees that alternative investment managers have been able to get away with because the bottom line is it was all jazz hands, as we like to say. It was all the illusion of something differentiated and special when the vast majority of investors would have been much better off just buying SPY or putting their money in Vanguard. And some, and yeah. some as it relates to alternative investments, the jig is up, and this deal represents that. Yeah. It's so interesting because in the past 12 months or so, everyone's been calling this the golden age of private credit. I mean, that's all I've been seeing. It's become this massive industry. We saw the largest private credit deal ever this year. Um, and I feel like the, you know, that's a result of this higher interest rate environment where fixed income has become more attractive. Um, and you know, you could go into public debt, you could go into junk bonds, or you could go into that sort of sexier, more exclusive, higher return category that is private credit. Um, but this news is basically suggesting that that sector maybe isn't so sexy anymore. Um, and I'm, wondering one why that is maybe it's just the returns haven't you know been up to an investor's appetite um but two do you think that this golden age of private credit that everyone's been talking about has just come come and gone it's come to an end the honest answer is i don't know but just just roughly speaking i would say that credit is a really good place for the first time i'm investing in credit because it feels like you're finally getting paid for the risk you're taking and that is if the 10 year is yielding whatever it is, 5%, you should be able to get, I would think, seven or eight in other credit instruments. Although Josh Brown said, you really aren't getting the premium you deserve over treasuries with junk bonds. Uh, yeah. And I think this is what this point, this, this is showing too. It's like you thought you were getting into the special credit instrument and maybe you know the demand isn't there because it's not so much better than a treasury. But here's the thing. I think what, uh, some analysts in the private credit markets would tell you is that there's not much risk, more risk than treasuries, because right. these companies have so much cash on their balance sheet and they're so bulletproof yep. that investing in an Apple or an NVIDIA, you're kind of investing in a T-bill. And so I think I would imagine this market's going to do well, this product's going to do well. But I mean, just an example, managers with more than $100 million in assets under management spent an average of 11% of their fees on marketing. And the Vanguard Group, which has almost $8 trillion in AUM, spent under $100 million on advertising, uh, meaning it's charging, and it ch only charges, get this, 0.08%. The, their average fee is 8 bips versus what is the typical hedge fund model is 200 bips a year plus 20% of the upside. And uh, just going back to advertising, Vanguard's only spending 1.6% of their fees on advertising. And I love the Jack Bogle, who's the founder of Vanguard. I love the statement, don't look for the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack. And again, this goes back to a fundamental lesson that we should all think about. And also, Vanguard has tried to be like Amazon. As they scale, they're lower their prices, except Amazon is now raising their prices. But anyways, 
1975, Vanguard's average fee was 0.68%, which was cheap at the time. Now it's 0.08%. And people don't realize, you think, well, it's only 2%. I can manage that. Or my broker's only charging me 1% of fees. The difference between 0.08% and 1% of your fees, when over time you have the same returns, and there's a lot of evidence showing that your buddy down the street who has insight and research from, from Morgan Stanley or whatever is not, is not capable of picking stocks any better than an index fund, you're going to lose a third of your returns to fees. And so what, what Jack Bogle said is don't look for the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack. And again, our advice to people is if you can't resist, and I fall temptation, you know, I, I fall into this trap, sure, buy an individual stock, learn about it, watch it, fine. But take the majority of your capital and put it in low cost ETFs like the kind that Vanguard or Schwab, or is it State Street or Fidelity offer? Because at the end of the day, one you're going to spend too much time looking at your phone. And two, you want to let time take over. And these guys outperform, outperform alternative investments. Ed, the jig is up. The jig is up. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see what these returns are actually going to look like. Let's move on to our third story. <clears throat> Ireland is creating a new sovereign wealth fund called the Future Ireland Fund. In most cases, a sovereign wealth fund is created when commodity prices rise, leading to some large unexpected windfall. But in Ireland's case, the source of income is quite different. The source of income for Ireland is specifically U.S. tech companies. There are now 950 U.S. businesses operating in Ireland, including Apple, Meta, Google, Amazon, and Pfizer. And they're there for one reason, taxes. Ireland has some of the most favorable corporate tax laws in the world, and as a result, it's been able to collect huge tax revenues. In the past eight years, its corporate tax income has tripled. And last year, it raked in $24 billion. Researchers say 10 to $15 billion of that should have been collected by the US. Nevertheless, Ireland will now use those profits to invest in its own sovereign wealth fund, which the government estimates could hit $100 billion in assets by the next decade. Scott, reactions to this news? Look, the, Ireland has been smart. They've been deft here. The, yeah. the, whoever's been managing this on behalf of the government has created this this great business of essentially helping large multinationals engage in tax avoidance. And what they do is very straightforward. You create an Irish subsidiary. Apple creates what they call it Apple International, and it's in Dublin, Ireland. And they give that entity all of the intellectual property of Apple. And then Apple International will lease or rent or license back that IP to their American unit for, call it, $50 billion a year, thereby suppressing profits in a high-tax domain and increasing profits in a low-tax domain. And Ireland says, all right, we'll charge you a lot less than the U.S. would charge on those profits. Um, and essentially, we have just pure tax avoidance. And instead of funding roads and schools in, in Cincinnati, we're funding them in Dublin. And uh, this is pure and simple tax avoidance by multinationals. And Ireland is smart. They're on the right side of this. And now they're creating, you know, this sovereign wealth fund. It should be called the Multinational Tax Avoidance Fund because that's really where it's come. People aren't investing in Ireland because of a unique, unique IP or, you know, there are some customer service centers there. Ireland actually has some very good universities. But this is just simply a function of them skimming off the top of their ability to attract and engage and facilitate uh, tax avoidance. So they're not doing anything illegal. The blame here rests with our elected officials who are not only whores, but they're cheap whores. And when these, the Better Business Bureau or the Chamber of Commerce or individual companies throw a little bit of money at them, they're willing to tolerate what is essentially a regressive tax structure where there are five companies in the Fortune 100 that don't pay any taxes. And so I find this is just a, you know, good for Ireland, but it's a symptom of a broader problem. And that is we need an alternative minimum tax for multinationals across all borders and a cross-border agreement. Otherwise, we're slowly but surely not going to be able to fund our Navy, Social Security, you know, pre-K, food stamps, you know, Medicaid, on and on. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of awesome new uh, bridges and roads in Dublin. Yippee! Well, the good news is, you know, you mentioned that global minimum tax. Uh, that's already 
about to happen. I mean, and it was because of Yellen and Biden pushing for it. And the, the, there's now a global minimum tax rate that will go into effect next year of 15%. It was signed by 136 countries. Ireland did not sign it until it was threatened to be punished by all these other countries if it didn't sign it. And then it did sign it. So that will go into effect next year. Um, that intellectual property tax law that you were talking about is is still in effect, but they have now had to raise that tax rate in accordance with the new law. Um, and you know they're gonna they're gonna start charging fifteen percent. Do you think that um, do you think that this solves everything? Do you think that now that if we have a flat fifteen percent corporate tax rate across the entire world, that we'll finally start repatriating the profits that the U.S actually deserves in the US. Oh, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And yep. Biden and Secretary Yellen d deserve just a tremendous amount of credit for this. It is absolutely the right strategy. And by the way, it wasn't easy to get all of these folks on the same page. And as you referenced, uh, mandated or required us to actually threaten and muscle Ireland into this. Because if you don't have everyone participate, it becomes a race to the bottom and everyone just says, okay, we're going to incorporate in the Isle of Man or in, you know, wherever uh, in Italy. So I think it's a great thing. I think it represents cross-border cooperation for the benefit of all of these countries' uh, public coffers. I think it should be 25%. I mean, 15%. I would bet your tax rate's higher than 15%, Ed. Mm -hmm. And so you have these organizations that I think you'd almost be better eliminating all corporate tax rather than having all of this wasted energy go into tax avoidance and then you have to transfer, try and repatriate the money when there's a lower, when there's a tax holiday. If you're going to let these guys weaponize government, you might as well get rid of corporate taxes and just have some sort of value added tax or something like that. But hmm. um, I like this idea of a multilateral uh, alternative minimum tax. I think it should be closer to 25 or in 30%. I think there's evidence that shows when you have tax rates that are this low, corporations are tempted not to reinvest the money. They distribute it out to shareholders, recognizing that at some point they might have to pay higher taxes. So it's a good time to distribute it out to shareholders, which results in a decline in R&D and CapEx, which creates lower growth and, lower, um, and less innovation in our economy. In sum, I think it's just ridiculous that corporations, I, just, I think there should be an alternative minimum tax across individuals. And corporations that say make over a million dollars or a billion dollars in profits, respectively, of twenty-five or thirty percent. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned how, that fifteen percent is too low because you know people love Ireland for the corporate tax rate because the current corporate tax rate is twelve and a half percent. So, I mean, how much of an improvement is this really? But then there's the question of okay, well, if you raised it to twenty-five, then how many countries would actually sign up? Um, but you know. Aside from, you know, you mentioned we should in part blame our elected leaders. I think a lot of the EU certainly blames Ireland. You know, they were, they've been obsessed with this issue for years um, and have criticized Ireland's government a lot. Should we also be blaming the tech companies here who so often, you know, preach their patriotism, talk about how they're creating jobs and shareholder value for for Americans and then meanwhile they're booking all their profits in Bermuda and Ireland do you think that our public discourse should hold Tim Cook Sundar Pichai Satya Nadella should we hold them more to account um, and criticize them in the media more than we're doing currently I mean we can try and shame them and there's some <laughs> value there but at the end of the day these companies will do what is best for their shareholders within the confines of the law. Who needs yeah. to be held accountable is us, and that is we need to elect um, officials, uh, congressmen and senators that hold these firms accountable and put in place an equitable tax structure and a progressive tax structure. Uh, and at some point, I mean, we keep running up debt on your kids and my grandkids uh, such that Nike, FedEx, Amazon, and I think there's two other companies will pay zero taxes this year, which is just, it just makes no sense. So these companies waiting on their better angels, these companies see above, we just talked about, you know, oil companies. Shaming is, it feels good, but it doesn't have a lot of impact is what I found. Mm. And waiting on these companies, better angels to show up is just not a good yeah. strategy. 
You need enforceable tax code across borders, and it needs to be more than 15%. And a multilateral cross-border 15% AMT is a start, and hopefully over time, they'll increase it. So we take in $5 trillion in receipts. We spend $7 trillion, so we have deficits of $2 trillion a year. We have a deficit now of $32 trillion. So what we have is a household that makes $50,000 a year, spends sixty five dollars or seventy, dollars and has debt of $320,000 and is continuing to add to its debt. It just isn't, you know, do we need to raise taxes or spend less? The answer is yes. And we need corporations, which generally account for about a third of our tax base. Uh, we're just going to need to increase taxes on them or more specifically ensure that they can engage in this type of tax avoidance because who really gets hurt here is the small and medium-sized companies that don't have offshore businesses that have no means of tax avoidance. So just as small and medium-sized companies get 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 hurt. So do you, Ed. You don't have the money or the economic makeup of running a small business or investing small companies or having enough capital to invest. You just have a number that gets reported on a W-2 and they look at it and go, okay, you make enough money to be in a thir- like a 33% federal income tax rate and probably a 10% city and state. You're going to pay 40 plus percent taxes. And it just, again... <laughs> We have this regressive tax structure because our elected representatives have been weaponized. Whoever gets the most money gets reelected. And an easy way to get money is to talk about how productive our wealth, you know, how important our most productive citizens are, and they should pay lower tax rates and give them all sorts of tax loopholes, whether it's opportunity zones or QSB or uh, 1202, and give corporations all sorts of of means of engaging in tax avoidance. I think at one point GE had more people in working on tax avoidance than on product development. They had a 400-person yeah. tax department. I think, I think Apple has a couple hundred people in its tax department, which is nothing but tax avoidance. But you know, just as a prisoner of war has an obligation to try and escape, companies have an obligation to serve their shareholders. And if they have to engage in tax avoidance, as long as it's legal, no one remembers anybody. No one's going to say at my funeral, you know, Scott was a good guy because he paid more taxes than he needed to. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. So- what they'll say is Scott was I'll a good guy. <laughs> Will you? They'll say Scott was a good guy because he was generous and he gave a lot of money away. And how do you get to that point where you be generous and give a lot of money away? You not only work hard and get lucky, engage in whatever legal tax avoidance you can find. So this is up to the voters and up to the people they elect. <laughs> he was a great taxpayer. That's what I'm he was say. a You're fan. Here. He just, oh my God, he paid ridiculous tax rate. Just <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Just final stat, in the past 20 years, U.S. companies booked $1.5 trillion in profits in Ireland. I think it's such an important issue. Everything that you brought up, you know, we need to be bringing in more money than we're spending. People are constantly freaking out about how much we're spending. It's like, let's have a conversation about how much we should be bringing in here. And we're, you said it best, the U.S. is paying for Ireland to build roads. Um and the whole thing is just insane. It feels like the perfect bipartisan issue um, to start getting these companies to start booking their profits in the companies in, in, in the country in which they're built. Um, it's a no-brainer. Let's, let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see earnings from Charles Schwab, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Johnson & Johnson, Netflix, and Tesla. Do you have any predictions for us? Nelson Peltz is going to get one, possibly two board seats at Disney in the next two weeks. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday, and we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.